for. Um, I'm a SharePoint architect at Keypoint, and uh, I'm really excited that everyone's here to join us. Um, I'm super excited that we've got uh, you know Andrew, uh, Liam, Joel, and Vlad on the line with us to give their you know um, uh, their their knowledge and you know decades of experience. Um, to give us some advice on this topic. Okay, my contact info is below in the screen. Um, it should also be in the in the uh, invite. But uh, let me know if, if you have any questions regarding our products. Um, near the end, there there will be a link to get to the expert series homepage. It's on keypoint slash blog slash experts. Um, it's also in the email invitation that you you should have received. So you'll be able to get updates there as well, some PowerShell scripts and um, an infographic at the end in, in a couple days from today uh, will be posted as, as well as uh, this video recording. We'll be having a uh, record, uh, sorry, a webinar tomorrow as well as um, next week on Tuesday for a follow-up for this series and it'll have a demonstration of one of the products by Keypoint to do cleanups, okay? I'm going to go over first the agenda of what we'll be covering. Uh, I'll make some introductions of the experts for those who you know, you know may need to learn a little bit more about who we have here. Uh, we'll cover then the expert advice. Basically, it's going to be in a question and answer format. So we'll have uh, uh, different topics, you know, around development for Andrew, infrastructure for Vlad, um, you know, etc. So we'll have uh, that section of the webinar will be covering the questions and answers. We won't be able to uh, answer every single question out there regarding cl uh, SharePoint cleanup, but we've gathered some of the most frequently asked questions nowadays that these experts have been getting um, and, and, and sharing them with you. During the webinar, there's a question section in your go-to webinar panel. You should be able to see that uh, where you can post questions that you might have to ask the experts, okay? So for all of our um, episodes, for the expert series, you'll be able to ask these questions and have direct access to these experts to to get answers. And um, let me just jump in right now for a second and just say, any time during the webinar, you can use the question and answer panel and put in your questions. And those questions will will be what we're going to build our collateral and content. Um, will, will basically be the questions we answer. So. I, I would highly recommend us if, you, if you're hearing some of the things we're talking about and it spurs up ideas, feel free to put those questions in. We definitely don't want blank, empty, empty time, so we definitely welcome your questions. Right, exactly. Thanks, Joel. Um, yep, so a after we go through some of the questions and answers with the experts that we have kind of the canned uh, questions and answers, there'll be a short um, uh, demo, and we'll also have uh, a, a time for you know answering the questions that you'll be posting. Okay. So let me go to the introductions. As you heard uh, just now, the voice of Joel Olson. Um, Joel, many of you may know of already. Uh, I sure have uh, heard of him long before I actually met him, and uh, you know I, I'd say that I've been working with SharePoint a long time, but you know, no one can say that as as uh, as Joel can. He was essentially the the first SharePoint administrator ever. Um, in the year 2000, Microsoft had released a product called Tahoe, I think it was called, and and then later became known as SharePoint. And Joel was the uh, um, part of the product team there, um, and essentially was the first the first SharePoint administrator ever. So um, he's made lots of contributions and. Um, shared a lot of knowledge that, you know, way back then there was very little uh, knowledge that you can find out there on SharePoint and help, and it's really gotten a lot better over the years, for, um, thanks to people like Joel um, that's helped us out a lot. Um, and going through these introductions, and I don't want to take too much time on it, but I wanted to ask each of the experts to, to just give us one thing that no one's known, that no one knows about them, um, that they could share, thought that might be interesting. Um, I know Joel even you're a world traveler. You went to some over 150 countries in your lifetime so far. Um, is there anything else you want to share with the with the group here that's interest you know that no one knows about you? Yeah, yeah. Um, some people may may not have uh, realized um, 
in my travels, I, I have some pretty crazy experiences. And uh, one of the one of the one of the ones that happened when I was in Vietnam. Um, it was a SharePoint Saturday, uh, great time. And uh, after the event, we had a speaker dinner, and they kind of singled me out, and uh, they ended up cutting up this cobra and cutting out its heart. And one of the cultural things there was to give the guest of honor a uh, beating cobra heart. <laughs> so I ended up uh, sh shooting with some, uh, some uh, anyway, with a drink, um, drinking, uh, this beating cobra heart. Uh, it was pr pretty crazy. In fact, uh, Ducks got a video, video of it. <laughs> I'll have to dig that up at some point. Wow. It's crazy. been pretty intense, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Oh, thanks, Joel. So, um, let's see, there's, we also have Liam, our uh, SharePoint ex security guru. So, any questions relating to SharePoint security, um, you, can, you can direct at Liam. Um, he's 11-year SharePoint MVP, and again, you know, I've, I've read lots of uh, articles from Liam. And um, Liam, thanks for, for being here. Do you uh, want to share something that um, with the group here? Uh, yeah, um, obviously I'm a true geek at heart. So one of the things that I'm quite proud of doing is uh, I have a bunch of Raspberry Pis in my basement and I built a Raspberry Pi cluster in my house, um, purely based on the fact that I wanted to be able to say that I'd done it more than anything else. It serves no other purpose in my house right now, but I actually have one. So I'm everyone, proud of that. everyone needs one of those in their house, right? Correct. You know, one of the things I love about Liam is his hacking SharePoint sessions. Uh, it, his was the first kind of, let me show, show you how, how he can hack SharePoint. So I love that uh, he kind of puts it on its head to show you how to secure SharePoint by showing you how easy it is to, to hack it when people do the wrong things. <laughs> but we won't be doing that today. Don't be doing that today. <laughs> no. <laughs> Great. Oh, thanks, Liam. Um, right. And then we've got Andrew, uh, our SharePoint development guru. Uh, and again, you know, I, I've followed Andrew for many years. My background's in development, and he's, he's always had uh, um, excellent articles and, and contributions as well. And you probably have seen him as well in, in Ignite and, and conferences. Um, he's also a 12-year SharePoint uh, Microsoft MVP. Uh, thank you, Liam. Or, sorry, thank you, Andrew, so much for being here. And um, really appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I heard you started a uh, SharePoint training company recently. Um, that sounds exciting. Uh, I think a lot of people could benefit from that. Um, is there anything you want to share with the team and you want to tell us a little bit about what you've been working on and, the, and maybe your, the, the training um, business that you started? Uh, sure. Thanks for having me, Chris. Um, so, yeah, I started a training business about a year ago. Don't have any courses out yet, but the one will be on the SharePoint framework for developers uh, targeting an early release of it later this month. Um, I guess interesting fact about me, nothing technology-wise, but um, going back many generations, uh, there's a guy named Daniel O'Connell, which is the great liberator of Ireland, who is a great, 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 I don't know how far you want to go back, grandfather of mine. So I uh, got a statue of a relative at the center of O'Connell Street in Dublin, Ireland. Awesome. Wow. One of the greats, like yourself too. I, for leading me, anyway. People, leading people <laughs> away from the PHP development. There you go. <laughs> you know the, what's well, interesting about Andrew is he's been doing training forever. I think he was one of the first SharePoint trainers, um, working way, way, way back. Um, some of the first Share, SharePoint training stuff. I remember meeting Andrew at some of those early, early um, training sessions. I poke fun at myself. When you can't do, you teach. So there, there you go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I don't. Thanks, Andrew. It's great to have you too. Um, and last but not least, we've got Vlad, our IT pro expert infrastructure. I know I've used. Uh, there's an article. I know Vlad's written many, but uh, maximizing uh, SQL Server for SharePoint. I used that for many years, and it was great. Um, anyhow, thanks, uh, Vlad, for everything you you know your contributions and for being here today. Um, is there anything you want to tell us about uh, yourself? Uh, dark secrets or something. Hey Chris, uh, really happy to be here. Well, uh, so actually the thing I had prepared, you all told me that I had to find something really funny to say about myself and then you're all being 
super cool epic travel adventure stuff so <laughs> it's not fair uh, the thing I was gonna say is that uh, something funny so I'm the only one I think one of the panelists today that is not from actual the US and in Quebec there's a lot of like fast food and a lot of things that we don't have that you guys have in the US so one of the things that I had to do every time I travel to the US I always try to hit up either a Nando's, a Chipotle or a 7-Eleven to get a big gulp <laughs> There you go. Uh, on the more serious side, <laughs> I have to be like cool like all the other guys here. I think I was one of the youngest SharePoint MVPs out there. I got my MVP when I was 21. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I got uh, the SharePoint depression oh. when I was young. <laughs> that might be a record. <laughs> Great. All right. Thanks, Vlad. Really good to have you here too. Um, okay, let's try to get to our questions, but first, uh, this poll is going to help the uh, experts understand what type of audience we have, so it'll help them gear their, their uh, answers, okay? So the first one is, uh, what SharePoint uh, platforms do you use? We've got, uh, you know, 26, SharePoint 2016, probably not a lot of people on that yet, but uh, 2013, 2010 and older. So if you can share this, that'll be great, so that, you know, help them understand what type of audience we have out there. Uh, for these, you know, cleanup uh, questions that we have. Yeah, and by the way, you can definitely select multiple. I know that there's some hybrid environments out there, and the idea is just to pick and choose the ones that, um, if you have older versions and newer versions, to pick and choose. Right. And it looks like we're about there. It's 2013 is definitely um, the largest sec section here. And we'll show okay. those in a second. Yeah. Go for it. All right. So you should be able to see the poll results. So, yeah, we've got a, a good portion on SharePoint 2013, oh, more than I thought on 2016, um, and a good portion on uh, SharePoint Online and some on 2010. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I want to hurry up and get to these, uh, these answers, what, really what everyone's here for. So uh, the first one is in the area of development um, for Andrew. The first question we have here for, for you, Andrew, is, um, you know, a lot of companies will have custom code and third-party WSPs also. Sometimes it's required and, um, you know, and, and, and sometimes it can cause problems. When, when a company needs to clean up or is thinking about cleaning up all these custom code and WSP components installed. What's your recommendation on the best approach to cleaning up um, WSPs and, and custom code? So I guess I'll, I'm not going to rephrase the question to make it more what I want to say, but just to kind of give you a little bit more context around it. So when I think clean up, what I think when people are asking this from a development point of view is I, you know, we've been doing things in a legacy way, like you said, doing WSPs, doing server-side code. What's the right way to move forward? Whether you're going to be on-prem, whether you're going to be in Office 365, um, I think that the the best approach that you should try to default to with all the stuff that you do that's that's extensibility-wise or customization-wise as far as SharePoint goes, is to build like you're like you're going to the cloud because SharePoint is now predominantly a cloud product that we then get essentially snapshots that will run on-prem. Um, if you build like you're going to Office 365, then everything that you build could potentially make it to Office 365, but it will also work on-prem. Uh, later this year, we're going to see a feature pack come out for, uh, for SharePoint 2016. I'd expect that we see that um, in September uh, at Ignite is when they'll probably announce it. That's just my reading the tea leaves and Microsoft taking advantage of a big event. Um, at Ignite and Orlando uh, to be able to do that. So I think the best approach, once, you, once they do that, then if you're on SharePoint 2016, um, then you'll be able to focus on using the things that you build, using the new framework that we're given to uh, use for extensibility, and that's the SharePoint framework where you build client-side solutions and you get a first-class de deployment model to ship stuff up to SharePoint, um, either on-prem or in the cloud. Now, that doesn't help the people who are still on SharePoint 2013, which I know we had a significant portion of those people uh, that were uh, that answered that poll so that they, you know, they're on SharePoint 2013. Um, and people, of course, that aren't even on 2013, you're still on 2010. 
or even older than that, 2007. For those of you, I, I apologize, or I not apologize, but I sympathize. Um, the, the approach that I would take in terms of cleaning up is that I think that anything that you build, you want to try and port it to being a client-side solution type thing. Something that is ideally is going to run in the browser, uh, so using JavaScript, HTML, CSS images to build your solution. Now, I know there's a lot of traditional SharePoint developers that are out there. They're going to roll their eyes and say, not interested in going there. I like my server-side code, so that's fine. But the idea is, is that you're trying to build in the spirit of things not running or being hosted by SharePoint, and instead, they're running in the client. So if you have to go, you, want, you don't want to go client-side, you still want to do server-side code, uh, I would try to build it to where it runs either beside or outside of SharePoint. Um, so you're not going to use the SharePoint uh, server-side object model, you're not going to be building uh, certain, you know, WSPs and features and stuff like that. Instead, what you want to be focusing on is building something that's going to run outside or external to SharePoint that either a client-side solution is going to be able to call from SharePoint, uh, so something, say, hosted in AWS or in Azure or in the Google Cloud Platform, um, things like if you're doing, you know, uh, event handler type stuff. Um, we have the capability to do that kind of stuff using Azure Functions and certain all the different serverless technologies that we have. But I guess to sum it up is that I think that whatever you have, if you're trying to clean up stuff and you're trying to move forward, uh, is you're going to have to rebuild the things that you've built as WSPs and running server side. And you're going to want that stuff to either run, I would first try to make it run client side. Not everything is going to be able to be, is to run client side and that everything is going to be able to take advantage of the SharePoint framework. So then your next kind of fallback is, okay, well, let's build it to where it does it can run outside of SharePoint and can talk to SharePoint using the different APIs and uh, SDKs that they have, that Microsoft has made available to us using the client object model or just using the REST APIs. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I myself, I went from server-side code and going to see some wasn't actually as bad as I thought. Um, but uh, but thanks. So it, so it sounds like you know you're you're, you're saying recommended is to, to move to uh, a client side model as much as possible. Um, I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say. I mean, I think that that's going to give you your your easiest transition um, to taking advantage of future versions of SharePoint. Microsoft clearly does not want to host your server side code inside SharePoint or in Office 365 anymore. The more you try to do that, the more you're just kind of you know bucking the trend of trying to you know push a rock up a hill it's just not going to happen that's not their, that's not their business model that's not microsoft's interest so i think it's better to adjust what you're doing if you still want to extend sharepoint or develop on top of sharepoint and so to that respect you know embrace what they're trying to do pushing us to the client pushing us off the server pushing us to <clears throat> external hosting environments like azure like aws like gcp or like your own if you're on prem like an IIS box, like, you know, if you want to do stuff like Azure Stack, there's plenty of options for doing it. But if you're building a DLL, if you're deploying it to SharePoint, you're, put, you're, you're essentially deploying to a brick wall. It's, there's, it, there's only so far you're going to be able to go, and Microsoft is making no investments in that area. So, yeah, something, I would... Something, uh, I, I just want to jump in here for a second, guys. Uh, this is Joel. Um, I, I've noticed that a lot of people who are trying to get out of their custom code solutions they've built on-prem, that if they if they look at it in as evaluation process, and essentially when those things were built, it was a buy versus build, and they decided to build. If you reevaluate buy versus build in relation to cloud, there's a lot, there's thousands of custom add-ins and solutions, um, and I hate to name any kind of by name, but as an example, one of the very popular ones is Nintex, and Nintex has got your forms and workflows and, you know, as an example, you know, there, there are hundreds of, or thousands of those types of solutions that whether you're trying to orchestrate something or trying to build a form, um, your Nintexes and K2s and, you know, there's, there's a ton of people out there that have basically built a lot of the heavy lifting for you. And I think some people need to just start over with, hey, maybe there's a framework, um, which actually may come up a little bit later, the word framework, but... Um, I think that, that idea of buy versus build, you may want to actually start over with that idea or the concept of buy versus build. All right, that's a good point. Um, I'm biased because we sell third-party products, but yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good option to, to look at. 
Um, okay, I want to keep moving because uh, I want to make sure we get to all the questions yeah. here. But uh, thanks, Andrew. Then that kind of leads into the second question for you: is um, if if moving if, if coming to the question of you know I've got my old server side code, why would I want to go to the SharePoint framework? Um, what are the top you know not all the advantages, but maybe the top few three or your top advantages for why you would suggest moving to the SharePoint framework, which would you know benefit me over you know finance you know it's more economical or support wise you know what are the advantages? Um, I think the biggest one is this is where Microsoft is moving where they're investing everything. Um, the big thing you know, they're all of their Microsoft's new extensibility pieces that they're doing in SharePoint Online and Office 365 and OneDrive, what are eventually going to be coming to SharePoint on prem as well they use the SharePoint framework. So if they're building their stuff on top of the SharePoint framework, that's considered, that's what we call first party. Um, we third party developers, people that are out there and who are gonna be, um, uh, when, when I wanna build something for SharePoint as Andrew Connell, I'm third party. So I'm using the same framework that Microsoft is using to build their own stuff. Uh, I know that they're gonna be adding more and more features to it. As they add more and more features to it, I get to take advantage of those as well. This is just the direction that they're going so should you convert old server side code to use the new SharePoint framework it's if it's stuff that is that you eventually want to run on in Office 365 or in future versions of SharePoint if you upgrade yes it's in your best interest but then again if it's stuff that you don't ever plan to go to Office 365 if you don't ever plan to upgrade from SharePoint 2013 or 2016 then you know you got to just you got to weigh that decision on does it make sense okay great um, so mainly you're saying if, if, if there's a reason where you are likely going to the cloud in the future, then you, you would recommend to look at using the SharePoint framework for its advantages. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's, it may not be completely necessary if you're going to stay on-premises. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, you look at it from, from greenfield or brownfield development. Greenfield meaning a brand new thing. I would first go to the SharePoint framework because that's what Microsoft that's what they're. That's where they're investing for, share, for SharePoint Online, SharePoint 2016, for brownfield stuff, which is I already have an existing environment. I got some existing solutions. Should I migrate it? It's like every migration. Let's look at what we have. Let's see if where you know it, does it make sense to migrate it? Should we just leave it where it is? Um, is it? Do we want to take advantage of of redoing this thing now and 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 uh, uh, adding new features to it and stuff like that? If so, hey, maybe I want to. Maybe I do want to go through and use a new. Uh, and this new framework. So it's all a case by case thing. It all, you know, classic SharePoint answer. It depends. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the direction I would go. Right. No, that makes sense. Um, okay. And and again, for anyone that's just joined in, um, there's a question section. So if you want to post some uh, questions directly for any of the experts, uh, you can you can post in the questions, and we'll be getting to that. Uh, shortly where we'll try to answer them. Okay. okay. All right, so let's get to infrastructure, um, flash administration, however you want to call it, but um, the infrastructure side, uh, we've got Vlad. Um, so the first question for, Vlad, for you, Vlad, is, uh, you know, for, for, you know, I've got a SharePoint environment, I need to maintain it. You know, what are the top three things would you say that I absolutely have to do to make sure my environment is, is you know, is healthy or is, you know, making making uh, sure that it's uh, not falling apart. You know, like there's patches and so forth. What are the top three things you would say that you have to do for an admin? Sure. So uh, number one is keep the devs like Andrew Connell in check because devs always break stuff. Now I'm joking, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is Andrew. You're not joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, in, I'll be in Orlando soon, so I want him to bring me to the SpaceX launches and everything again, so I have to be nice. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so uh, one of the things that, and I talked a lot with customers, what are your priorities? Because keeping SharePoint healthy, keeping SharePoint fast, and keeping SharePoint secure are the top three things that uh, SharePoint admins should take care of. One of the things that has really gotten a bigger bigger importance lately is make sure your SharePoint stays up to date. We've seen this 
even this year we've seen this quite a few times where there's been hackers that attacked systems only because they're out of date and if they're on the latest patch if they're using the latest version of windows server or uh, windows client they would have never had that bug and hackers were able to get into like banks government agencies only because they're using outdated software so make sure that you're actually installing the latest updates for sharepoint and i know that SharePoint has a bad reputation with the reliability of its cumulative updates. And I mean it's absolutely true for SharePoint 2010 and 2013, Microsoft didn't deliver the biggest quality cumulative updates. They've been like fixing one bug and introducing three new ones. But with SharePoint 2016, it's been almost, I think it's been more than a year so far, there hadn't really been any bugs introduced with public updates. So the quality process is a lot better. Uh, they've been shipping stuff and testing stuff a lot more so make sure that both on the Windows Server side and on the SharePoint site you're keeping up to date with the latest security patches so you don't get hacked because you're probably hosting a lot of sensitive data on SharePoint and you don't want to be the next company in front of the newspaper with documents that have been leaked to WikiLeaks. So that's number one. Uh, number two is make sure that you have you look at those reports. SharePoint has a lot of useful reports built in. There's also a lot of third-party tools that are able to tell you how your infrastructure is doing, how is everything doing. I know a lot of people that never go, for example, in their search service application to look at their search crawl logs. Uh, sometimes when I go as a consultant there, I go to make a health check and then I realize like, hey, you realize that out of like, the, like say a million documents you have in SharePoint, you have 300,000 errors. And those are actually not only people cannot find them, and as you know, search is how people find things those days. So basically, nobody looks at those documents anymore, and they probably upload them two times or three times because they think it's not there. But it also makes your crawl database and a bunch of databases get huge because it's storing all that 300,000 errors every day when you do a crawl or every 15 minutes because it's not able to find them. So make sure that you look at, you look almost every day at, do I have any new errors stuff in the event viewer? Do I have any errors on my network? Do I have any errors on the SQL server? Do I have any errors anywhere like in the search service application? So make sure you monitor those, make sure that you uh, look at them and you understand them and you fix them as soon as possible. Uh, there's a lot of SharePoint errors, especially that usually they're like out of the box errors. Whenever you install SharePoint, you don't even have a site on there and you already have 25 errors in the event viewer and in the health check. So I know it's not all of them that are mandatory to, for you to look at, but make sure you monitor because there's some really important stuff there. And sometimes you'll see that a site collection went from one gig to one terabyte overnight. And this can have a huge impact if you don't monitor it. This can have a huge impact when your SQL Server drive or your host databases gets full. Well, it might all go down. So make sure you monitor your SharePoint. And lastly, this one is not really, for, well, it's for regular maintenance as well as for uh, the security. And I know Liam will talk a lot, talk a lot more about security. but. Make sure that all your stuff is secure. Make sure that uh, you use HTTPS all over the place. Uh, a lot of companies that I still uh, go to is like, they still use HTTP. They don't really care about uh, the security because like uh, that's inside the network anyway. So make sure that you secure everything and make sure that you document everything as well. Because you never know when you have a new person coming in and if your SharePoint infrastructure is not documented or if you don't play with SharePoint every day, if you're not a dedicated admin, make sure you document all the changes, make sure you document when certificates expire, make sure or when other stuff in your infrastructure expires, make sure you have all that documented as well as procedures of what happens if, how do we change it, what if, if we have a solution deployed, where does it affect things? So if I ever do an update, I know exactly when I know exactly where I have to update it. So those are kind of my top three things. Okay, great, thanks Vlad. So I got uh, first is mainly patching, making sure your environment is you know up to date 
um, with the patches. And I know you said a lot more. I'm just uh, trying to summarize. But uh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, again, these are going to be recorded this webinar, so anyone can play it back um, to to hear all the answers. Uh, and number two is make sure to read, you know, event viewer and their logs. Uh, you know, a, a lot of times I've been to environments where no one reads the logs and there's plenty of errors and people just don't know what the users are going through if they can't find things or if things are you know, having errors with search. So that's a good one. Um, and then number three, make sure you use uh, HTTPS and make sure that you're documenting your environment. And, and, and that's another one that a lot of people overlook, I think. So um, is that right, Vlad? I got those. That's about it, yeah. Yeah. OK, great. Um, the next one we have for you, Vlad, is, is around content databases. Um, what are, what are, you know, what, what, what would you say are best practices in, in ma maintaining and cleaning up, um, you know, content databases, large ones, or what would you, what do you look at when you, when you're looking at content databases? Sure. So, uh, I look, actually look at a few things. First of all, I know that SharePoint 2016 supports, uh, databases up to one terabyte, no problem, and it's still within the, uh, off between the best practices. However, it's uh, try to keep them small because when you keep your database really, really big, it will, first of all, it will make it actually a bit slower and also taking a backup of your database because I'm sure most of you take backups on the SQL side and not on the SharePoint side. If you take a database of a 200 gig database, it's so much, it's a lot faster to take the backup. It will be easier if you ever want to restore it. It will restore a lot faster. And if you ever want to move it to a QA environment for testing after or for a refresh, it will be a lot easier to do. So even if Microsoft supports huge databases and actually the the actual remit for like inactive site collections is like four terabytes. But Try to keep a databases under 200 gigs. I know this was the recommendation up to SharePoint 2013, but I still try to keep my databases low. And if I ever have, for example, a database that's at 500 gigs, and I see that, hey, there's like 20 site collections in that database, you can actually move site collections to a different content database. With PowerShell, you can use the move SP site, and then you can create new content databases. And of course, creating new content databases is free. So it's not like you have to pay or anything. It's just like a lot simpler to keep large site collections in their own content database, makes it a lot easier to back up, restore them, or if you ever have to do any maintenance on only that content database, it's a lot easier to only be specific to a site collection. And also because if you migrate without a migration tool, whenever you migrate like uh, the SharePoint way, also the Microsoft way, you migrate one content database at a time. So by keeping them small, you can actually migrate one site collection at a time. If you want to do a migration a few sites at a time or not everything, it's, it will be a lot easier to select the sites that you migrate when it's time to migrate everything. So that's kind of number one. Uh, number two, I would say, make sure you have some SQL maintenance script that you uh, do your backups. And then whenever you, after you do a full backup, you string the log, you re-index the database, you have all that stuff in there. Because if not, if you don't take care of your databases and if you don't back them up, uh, a lot of the content databases are set on full recovery mode. So the actual database logs will fill up. And it will take a lot of space. And after one year, you will look at it and you will like, hey, I have like one terabyte of database logs on there. How did that happen? So make sure you monitor your databases. Make sure you have your SQL maintenance plans in place so all the data is where it should be. And make sure, of course, that it, where needed. Uh, for example, if you have availability groups, they all need to be on full recovery mode. If you're not doing, for example, I have a lot of clients that SharePoint is not business critical. And that's fine. I mean, I love SharePoint, but it's not always business critical. And they only take SharePoint backups once a day because that's, that's what they need for their system. And that's, I mean, that's fine if that's what they need. If you only take a, if you don't take log backups and you only take a database backup once a day, you don't need to have full recovery mode. Put it to simple recovery mode and you're not, if you're not doing database backups, you're not going to need that log file anyway. 
also pre-grow your databases. Uh, and that's one of the things I say often for optimization is that uh, make your model database, make sure that when you create a new content database, you can actually pre-grow it. So by default, when you create a new database in SQL, it will take the size of your model database. So if your model database size is 8 megs, which is by default, your new content database will be 8 megs. You can, if you don't want to change the model database, simply go into the content database and make it maybe 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 gigs from the start, depending on how much content you plan to have in the first six months. So this way, you really have the database doesn't have to auto-grow. SQL has this mechanism where if ever the database reaches its current size, it will use the auto-grow mechanism to actually grow more to have space for new files. But if you have, let's say, a 100 meg database, your auto-growth is set at 1 meg, and somebody uploads a 10 meg document, well, the database will have to pre-grow 10, to auto-grow 10 times before that user is able to save that document into SharePoint. So that will make everything a lot slower. So make sure to go into your content databases, make sure to look at what their current size is, uh, how much free space is in there, and if you see there's not, not a lot of free space, pre-grow them. So this way, they don't have to auto-grow, and it will be ready for people to start adding documents and collaborating without waiting on SQL Server to auto-grow databases. So uh, that's Great. about it. Great. Thanks, Vlad. That's a lot of good information there. Um, so just to quickly recap, so I heard, uh, you know, to, to help maintain your content databases and cleaning them up, uh, you recommend still, although the, the limit has been increased, to hit one terabyte, I believe, or uh, higher, yeah. um, to keep it under 200 gigabytes and, and use PowerShell perhaps to, to, to move a, a SP site or site collection to another content database. Um, and number two, the uh, make sure you have your maintenance plans, your SQL maintenance plans running on schedule, and that you're doing backups to to make sure that the logs get uh, sh shrunk or truncated. Um, and number three, you can pre you know use a use a model um, database or or make sure that you set the Right, database characteristics and settings, and you can pre-grow databases for when you're creating new ones um, to help with ma maintenance. Does that sound about right? That sounds really perfect. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, one more poll is, uh, you know, what are your top cleanup priorities? In the end, we'll, we'll um, post these. Uh, so, so, when you're thinking of cleanup, what is the most important uh, cleanup topics for for you, we've got permissions and security. You know, is something that you're really concerned of, of with with cleanups in your environment. Uh, content databases. You know, you're you're concerned with large content databases and don't know how to. Um, you know, you want you want some help with managing that. Uh, your backups are slow, etc. Pre migration and server side code. So when you're if before migrating, you may want to. Um, Look at old server side code, or you know maybe pre migration is something that you're you're working on right now that you need help with or some advice with cleanups um, or and then we've got another option for performance so you know uh, cleaning up to optimize performance for for I guess the end users okay so the so the votes are coming in uh, I'll, be, I'll be sharing this in a moment looks like we got about half the people voting and be great. Great to have some more people vote. It looks like, so far, permissions and security is leading the pack, but it's amongst the rest. It's pretty neck and neck. Pretty even, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's getting close to. I think that's, that's oh, it's past seventy now. All right, yep. great. I'm going to share this. Yeah. So yeah, permissions and security. Um, looks like mo biggest concerns. Um, performance kind of creeped up there, and it's a, it's a bit more of a concern uh, to clean up to improve performance. Okay, I want to make sure we make use of all the time we have left um, to get to the questions from everyone. So, again, if you just joined, please you can post some questions in the questions area. Uh, we'll try to answer them shortly. Okay, now next for, is for Joel um, UI and uh, user experience cleanup. 
Um, the first question is, what what what's your best practice or perspective on uh, for cleanups on keeping an intranet you know relevant? Well, you know, I think this is uh, one of the areas that um, people forget about is the fact that the intranet and the home pages on uh, various um, on your various top level pages, the people people have to use that. And uh, if it's not interesting and engaging, there's really some things you can do to, to, to optimize that. You know, people complain about not getting adoption, and the first thing you notice is they've got the same list or the same library or the same static web part or the same images that just don't rotate, don't change. And so my, my recommendation there is to really analyze it from what I, is this information useful? Is it relevant? Um, so, you know, we talk about relevancy and getting adoption. If you've got a bunch of static content, it doesn't matter whether it's the intranet or your SharePoint sites, but there's, there's so many web parts that have been created that just simply are not being used by teams to, um, to basically make your, your site more interesting and engaging. I think that the new communication site, as an example, is one that's designed around being able to, to show the new news as an example and show what's kind of going on in a site. Well, imagine if the top level site has the same news from two years ago. As soon as somebody visits that site, they notice, oh great, this is, you know, it's, it's not even relevant. Somebody's not using this site. I mean, people will basically turn off and say, I'm going to stop following the site. I don't care because it's not relevant. And the funny thing is, is two levels down, there's some list that's going nuts. And so really, there's a lot going on, but if your pages aren't reflecting that, you're going to have adoption issues, and you're going to have people that are going to just dismiss SharePoint and say, "Well, SharePoint doesn't show me relevant things. It's it's old. It's arc. You know, it needs to be archived." So that idea of keeping things fresh is is the other part of it. Um, you know, so, so it's making it building eye candy. I, I would say is kind of that first thing as as a best practice of making it dynamic and relevant and then keeping it fresh. So often it's, people will sometimes keep the responsibility all for themselves, but it's much, much better to actually get the departments and divisions sharing that burden. And very soon it doesn't have to be a burden. Like there was a guy once on an intranet and he was like, you know what, I, I hate our news component. I was like, what, what do you mean you hate it? And he's like, he was, he's like, I have to create news um, once a week, and it's the worst part of my job. And, I, and I'm thinking, well, if you hate it, what do you think the people who are reading your news are, are going to like? And I'm like, stop, stop, stop creating news that is not relevant or that is, is news that you hate. You know, you're just doing it to do it. People are going to not enjoy reading it. People need to be writing about the stuff that they care about. Um, and anyway, I'm, I'm sure I could go on and on, but it's a lot about fresh and dynamic and uh, focusing on a, on things that can can be automated to, to keep showing the documents that are new. Show, show the fresh side of your, your SharePoint sites for your intranet. Okay, great, thanks, Joel. Um, okay, so so mainly is, um, you know, there's a lot of high, you're saying there's a lot of pages and high visibility pages you want to look at to make sure from a cleanup perspective that uh, You've got fresh and relevant information there. Clean up the old archive, you know, get rid of the old content, perhaps, and make sure that you've got things that people can engage with. Um, hopefully, I didn't miss anything, but uh, I think that's yep. mainly the, the goals that's, there. That's the gist of it. There's web parts built into the product. As an example, content query, the search web parts. You know, basically, there's a lot of stuff that's in the box that can help you get there. In addition to all the third parties that build more, you know, eye candy type stuff. But, right. Yep. Great. Okay. And then the next question we have is, when doing an upgrade, um, you know, there's so many new apps that come out from Microsoft and, um, you know, there's third-party tools, but even just with Microsoft apps, like there's Flow and there's, you know, there's, there's, there's Microsoft Teams um, and Planner and so forth. So when, when using in SharePoint, and there's a new technology that we might want to move to to replace old ones. Um, what would you yeah. What would you suggest would be the approach? Yeah. 
That's, that's a good question. So essentially, you're, you're going to the new version. The first thing people do is they want to pick it all up and then dump it into the new version. And often with customers, I like to say, let's, let's do an art of the possible. Let's actually explore, explore the new technology and talk about how do you want to take advantage of it. And let's actually build the destination. And then we can decide what we want to pick up and move into it. If you simply take your 2013 and, and simply dump it in 2016, guess what? It's going to look and feel exactly the same. And it's not even going to feel like a new version. Um, it, it's going to be a painful experience. You're going to hate it. What's much better is you build out your destination. You know, maybe you're looking at one of those new fancy uh, communication sites, or maybe you're looking at uh, an intranet in a box from one of the dozens of third parties that builds a really nice, new, and exciting intranet built on top of Office 365 or SharePoint 2016. And then you're kind of saying, what do we want to put into there so that when, when we have these dynamic web parts that pull, bubble up technology, we're really looking at good stuff. And let me give you kind of one key thing here is as an example, you're going to keep pushing your old info path workflows and the poor experience that they have in terms of doesn't work on this browser or doesn't work in mobile or I can't print it to a PDF. There's so many things that are wrong with info path. And if people could just leave it in the grave or let it die and move out of it into flow and power apps and any of those third parties that are out there, um, you're going to have a much, much, much better um, experience than just saying, you know what, we're just going to upgrade it, and then maybe eventually we'll get to it. Um, that, that forklift scenario of pick it up and dump it is, is, is got to go. And especially with Teams, how many teams are now using Teams rather than using old SharePoint sites? And if they're not, what, how can you map it and actually look at that strategy of leveraging Teams? So, so much better. My team barely uses SharePoint. Um, in terms of collaboration, you know, we use it as an upgrade as an intranet platform, but for the most part, our team does all of its communication in Teams now, and the documents automatically go into SharePoint. It's a much, much better use of the technology. Great, great, thanks, Joel. So, um, so in other words, kind of stay away from the big forklift and just taking everything from your old and dumping it into new, just just because it's new, and kind of take a step back and analyze what is in this new technology and what you can take advantage of um, and where a lot of these new technologies are definitely beneficial to replace things like InfoPath and um, but to stay away from when you're moving to stay away from just kind of dumping it into the new platform and just uh, exactly I, I feel like you're shooting yourself in the foot when you just say you know what we're gonna move it then we'll think about it it's a, it's a really bad strategy just to say you know we'll, we'll get to it eventually bad strategy. SharePoint's going to continue to be the thing that everybody points at and says this this is no good. It's the place where people dump their stuff. You know, upgrade is that opportunity to get it right each time. Let's let's start with what we want and move our stuff into that structure. Great. Okay. So, yeah, we're running a little bit short on time now. So, um but these are all the great answers. Uh so, so for security, uh Liam just what would your approach be? So when cleaning up permission, this was, you know, and this was the top uh, cleanup uh, topic, what would your approach be? And I know this is kind of generic, but um, where would you look first? You know, item level, um, you know, for performance reasons or um, users with direct access, how would you do it? And, and what's your experience with, with this? Okay. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, obviously, those of us that have used SharePoint for a while will know that the out-of-the-box tools are not the greatest. I mean, in reality, in order for me to get a list of who has permissions wherever, there's nothing fundamentally in SharePoint that lets you do that. I mean, obviously, you can use the user check if you're concerned about users. I mean, because realistically, that's where the permission issues occur. You know, we, we follow the model that was given to us, which is to delegate um, site ownership to individuals, and then we hand them the keys and say, knock yourself out and you look after and don't bug me as IT because I don't want to keep managing permissions. And then we reach a point where we get help desk calls and people can't get in or they've lost access or the, somebody has access they shouldn't do. So I mean, realistically, you're starting at every single layer in SharePoint, which is a pain because there's not really one point that you need to focus on. It's, it's broken inheritance. It's inherited permissions too because they could be wrong. 
I mean, realistically, the only way of actually doing it is you either go through manually, which is a pain, or you use something like PowerShell, where PowerShell is great for this. If you're looking for tasks that can be repeated, PowerShell is fantastic. Iterate through, dump out a list of all the permissions, and then hand those permissions off to have them checked by the owners of the sites. Um, or you can use third-party tools. I mean, like the tool that you guys have got. I mean, that does the same thing. Um, but that only covers the, the list of getting stuff out. The fixing is still, a, right now, is still a manual process. If you find a list or library that's got broken inheritance that shouldn't have it and the permissions have been added for individual users, the only way of fixing that is to manually make a change. Again, you could use PowerShell or other components to do that. But that's really the world that we sit in. It's, it's not the most pleasant thing to have to do, is to go and clean up permissions. Just because by the very nature of having the word share in its name, the idea is that you just allow people to kind of do their thing. So for me, I think that's where you start getting a report out of SharePoint first is your starting point. Whether it's manual, PowerShell, or a third party component, that's where you have to start first and start at every single level in SharePoint. OK, great. Um, so, so what I hear is uh, there's really no out of the box um, permissions tool, you know, to get an, a big overall picture. And you and what you do is usually you can use PowerShell to iterate through and get a, you know, a picture of where you stand first. Um, do you have any suggestion for like what to look at first, or really it just comes down to every environment is different, and you would. Um, you know, like item level, do I, well, should I be concerned with a lot of item level permissions or too many users or, you know, or that just really depends, I guess, on the requirements and, and, and you mm -hmm. think that just the, uh, so mainly is you'd want to get an overall picture and use PowerShell or something to get a report, right? It would be the yeah, first. Yeah, I mean, obviously right. the, big, the big concern's always been in every version of SharePoint is this unique permission where you've added individual accounts. I mean, that's always been an issue for way back in the early versions of SharePoint. You know, I've got 50,000 people in my organization and Joe decides to add a thousand of those into one file, you know, as permissions. I mean, there are fundamental things in the SharePoint stack that will break when you put too many unique permissions into certain places. So that's always a good starting point. Let's look at the unique permissions. Let's look at where people have broken inheritance and then let's try and fix those. And the fix for those is you go back to the model that we're supposed to use, which is we have users in Active Directory groups and we add the groups to where they're supposed to be. So that's kind of where I like to start. I get the report that comes out and then work back, back, back basically from the bottom upwards. So the lowest, the lowest level that permissions can be assigned and work right. back that way. Right, right. Okay, great. Okay, and I apologize, everyone, that uh, you know we're, we're a bit late on time, so um, the the webinar will go a little bit past the hour. I know some of you might have to drop off for meetings, but uh, let's keep going. Um, if you can try to, I guess, quickly answer this one, Liam. Um, for for an overall strategy for cleaning up SharePoint, what would be the goal to you know? Do you have any idea of like a overall you know using AD groups, for example, would be one, I guess. But uh, you know. I don't want to put the answer in your mouth, but I mean, sure. you know, what, what strategy would I strive for, you know, not using individual users or what would you, you know, that might be it, but what, what would you say? I think realistically, I mean, historically, Microsoft had always pushed, you know, use Active Directory groups. That's going to be your boundary. Never add individual users. But in reality, that doesn't work um, because it, there are times where you do need to have a smaller subset. I mean, I, I've walked into clients before where they have 10,000 plus Active Directory groups just for SharePoint. And that's purely based on them having to create an Active Directory group for every type of permission that they ever wanted to have. Now, you, now that's great, but that meant that managing Active Directory was awful. It was a pain for them to do anything. And it also meant that IT had to manage everything. Whereas in reality, the best practice is to kind of do what Microsoft had always said, is have the users and have AD groups, put the AD groups in the site groups and assign the permissions in the site groups. However, don't be afraid to put individual users into a site group where needed. Now, it doesn't make any sense really to have AD groups and site group and individual users together, but where possible, if you do need to break inheritance or you do need to have unique permissions, 
then be realistic about it. If you need to have unique permissions for 50 people, go and create an AD group for it. If you need unique permissions for five people, you don't need an AD group and you can just assign the permissions where you need to. But it goes hand in hand with the first question is make sure you know that that's what you did. Because nine times out of 10, when I do an audit of an environment, no one seems to know why something was done. So even though your best practice would be AD users, AD groups, and site groups, which ultimately maps into the way SharePoint Online works as well, you still need to know that you have those changes so that you can say, well, actually we broke inheritance here and this was the reason why. So it comes back to that governance kind of management stuff as well. But that's, that's, really, that's really the best practice. If you follow what it is, AD users, AD groups, site groups, and then break where you needed, when you make the move to SharePoint Online and Azure AD, that's exactly the model that Azure AD and SharePoint Online uses. So you'll be in the best place. That's the ultimate place to go to. But obviously, just don't go crazy with all these users everywhere because that will that doesn't bode well in Office in, in SharePoint Online either. Right. And again, going back to your answer for number one, I think that helps once you have uh, some kind of a mechanism or your PowerShell or some type of a reporting tool in place, then you'll you know, you can rerun that to get yes. an idea of where things and kind of maintain things and keep things clean. Yeah, and I, I, I think just to add, I think that's like one overarching thing is too often what tends to happen is, you know, you have someone come in, you help build a SharePoint environment, it's all good to go, it's super, it's got fantastic content, all the permissions are right. And then the next time someone looks at it and has an audit is a year later. I mean, there's a lot of changes that get made in a year and then trying to retrospectively go back and fix permission things that were done six months ago that you don't remember why, it's really, really complicated. So I'm always a great advocate of, you know what, let's run this report. So I worked with a client recently, um, they're based out in Tampa, and they run a set of PowerShell scripts every 30 days. And every 30 days, it runs out, does a security report, brings it back, it gets sent to the owners of those areas, and then they make changes those those 30 days. But of course, understanding that not everybody has the resources to do that, but with something that can be automated, it's a piece of cake. And I, I would suggest, you know, at least every quarter have an audit done so that you can capture these issues. Nothing worse than finding that someone's got permission that shouldn't have permission, and then they take content that they shouldn't have. And my last little thing, Chris, before I let you go, is um, say no. I, sounds funny, but when just because the CEO says he wants access, tell him no, because he may not need access. That will be your biggest win in controlling some of the security issues that I see, is when somebody says, I need full control to that, the answer is no, you don't. Explain to me why you need access. I know it's a hard conversation to have, but you'll save yourself the hassle in the future. Great. Thanks, Liam. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we've got uh, uh, another poll here, and again, um, this will be recorded, so uh, I know some of you might need to drop off, but what uh, this poll is, on the upcoming episodes, what would you, what would you find, um, uh, what would you like to address in upcoming episodes, what do you think is the most uh, important to you, and okay, so this poll is already launched, and You've got, you know, what are the most powerful favorite features of SharePoint 2016? Uh, maintaining a hybrid environment we've got, um, you know, like Office 365 and on-premises. Microsoft Flow and Power Apps, that's a hot topic. Um, artificial intelligence in SharePoint, how could I leverage it? There's a big buzz around that right now, so is, is there anything there? Um, and then if you have any other, um, you know, topics that you'd like us to discuss in the next episode, please post it in the questions. Okay, so about uh, almost 70%. Okay, great. Um, all right, so mostly SharePoint 2016, a close second is Microsoft Flow and Power Apps, and then we've got a hybrid environment, maintaining a hybrid environment. Okay, great. All right, so now um, I'm going to try selling you on some of the products, but I'll, I'll, I promise to make this quick. Uh, we have a toolkit 
um, called SharePoint Essentials Toolkit that will help you with your cleanups, okay? Um, there's, you know, some of the top features, there's no server install, you know, there's a built-in scheduler, and uh, export, you know, reports automatically to SharePoint, like these permission reports, item level permission reports, um, you know, list inventory and site inventory. There's uh, many reports that you can use uh, in the tool for uh, helping you with your cleanups. For example, there's a spot to fix broken links in your environment, um, finding files that are old or large. Um, you know, if you need to find old web parts, you can also you know, build a report on where those are located, etc. cetera. Um, there's a spot for site and list cleanup, so finding old sites, getting a, a, lar you know, a huge list of all your sites without knowing PowerShell, um, and you, know, you can see who was last modified or when the site was last modified, finding old sites, large sites, um, and bulk deleting sites, et cetera. Hey, Chris. Um, yep. It looks like there's a question in the Q&A that relates right to the, your product even. It says, is there a way to find broken links to anything, links to documents, images that I want to move or delete? Oh, yeah. So there is a, a component, um, part of SharePoint Essentials Toolkit called Broken Link Manager. So after doing a migration or uh, even just doing a cleanup, you know, you can find all the dead broken links inside of web pages and web parts, inside of files even. So inside, it has very deep scanning capabilities, so it will find links inside of files uh, like PDFs, Word documents, etc., cetera, uh, in metadata in your navigation, and it will also do automatic find and replace, so you can put in the uh, um, find and replace rules. Um, and, and we'll have a, a webinar tomorrow as well as next week. You'll get an email invite for, for if you want to participate in that, but yeah, it's called Broken Link Manager. It's on our website as well, so um, yeah, thanks to all for pointing that out. And there's another uh, one. Uh, let, let me just give you this as well, because I think it'll okay. help you as you're um, doing your covering your stuff. Yep. I've customized a lot of pages in Designer. Now I hear they won't cleanly upgrade. How can I find all of them to get ready for upgrade? And and I imagine this probably works for a lot of things where it's like, hey, I've got a web part on there I want to remove from a lot of pages, or I've got a lot of you know. I'm sure there's a lot of scenarios where it's like, help me find this thing, um, such as a JavaScript snippet or whatever. Oh yeah, yep. So we have an item query tool, um, which was a couple slides back, but that will allow you to find web parts, uh, scripts even. Um, you can paste the text. It supports regular expressions, so you can. It'll build an Excel type of tabular report with all of the locations of all of the you know matches that it will find. Um, so it'll parse inside of documents as well. So even looking for an old CEO's name or departmental name changes, um, scripts, et cetera. So old error, you know, web parts, or if you've migrated and you've got error, web parts that show, you know, error web part cannot be displayed, it can help you find all of those in a single report, okay? Um, and then here we've got the permissions. Uh, thanks again, Joel. Uh, we've got the permissions here, um, like Liam was explaining. So it goes across sites. You know, I, I've worked with SharePoint quite a while, not as long as Joel, of course, but. Um, you know, this is always an issue, and I could write PowerShell, but, you know, not everyone can, and, and you know, updating it and so forth, so this tool will allow you to do that. Um, okay, so um, we have a short demo after, but I want to get to the questions, because that's what I've, um, we've got a, a bunch of questions here that we want to get to, and some of them we have tried addressing while we're ta speaking. So, Joel, I'll, I'll hand this over to you, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to answer some of these for maybe a uh, uh, a few five minutes or so because um, I yep. know it's, it's a bit long yep. yeah yeah no problem so I'm, I'm just gonna pick and choose a few random ones yep. um, somebody says they got a new job as the SharePoint 2013 admin and they're wondering if there's any ideas on what they should do first and they're saying they do not use PowerShell but they're not sure what to do first it hasn't been managed for two years <laughs> sounds like a great cleanup project where do they start Anybody on our panel want to jump into that one? Vlad? Oops, Vlad. sorry. There we go. Yeah, no, I'm still, I'm still here. So, <laughs> of course, somebody had to remain on mute and talk without actually yep. talking, right? That's exactly. what I was talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so when, when you're the new SharePoint admin, what do you do? Uh, first of all, try to find out 
uh, what what do you have for like what are people using SharePoint for? For how long they've been using it? How important is the, is the stuff that they have on there? Because then after that you'll maybe find out that hey, I actually don't only have a SharePoint farm. I have five SharePoint farms that I need to take care of. So make sure you try to talk to people, try to see what SharePoint sites they use, and you try to document what the infrastructure looks like in the back. Uh, then the other thing that I do is I always look at the backup settings because I don't want to be the new admin and then on my second day have somebody come to me and be like, hey, I've been using this site for a while and I really can't access it today since somebody has deleted it or I deleted this by accident and I want to restore it. So one of the things I make sure is that proper backup procedures are in place. So if anything happens, I know like I can restore it and it's not going to be a crisis. And other than that, try to see if there's any cleanup you can do. Try to see if uh, maybe this is the chance to actually migrate to a SharePoint 2016 and also clean clean it up. Uh, make sure you have, like, or if you're staying on 2013, make sure you update the, to the latest updates, latest cumulative updates, uh, and so on, so you're up to date. Thanks. Um, this next question um, is, uh, Best practices for site collection design hierarchy for SharePoint Online, and I, I want to be I want to kind of make these a little bit quick. So I'm going to just give you a quick answer and then see if um, I, I found that the site collection object is is a great object. If you're doing collaboration, use site collections. Don't go super super deep. Um, if you're doing intranets, yeah, keep it contained within a site collection unless you're getting really really large, and then um, Microsoft has to worry about your database since you're in online, but ultimately they're much easier to move around if you've got them as site collections, even with um, even with SharePoint Online. Um, but in terms of hierarchy, like I mentioned in the uh, the previous question, I was kind of saying build out that hierarchy and then kind of move into it is a, is a good good way to go, good approach. Um, here's a one for Andrew. Tell me about cross-site publishing and when best to use them. So, like, here's an example of a new you know, to them, cross-site publishing may be new. What's a good example of when to use that? I might actually be a bad person to ask for this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't done this, and I haven't looked at this kind of stuff in many, many years. So I would, I probably would defer to either, probably either you or Vlad on this one. Yeah. Okay. So cross-site publishing. I, I think, in my opinion, the only one where the time when it's useful is when you want to have like I know a public site and an internal site, or uh, really like the site that is people facing and a, I'll say a QA site or a non like a, not the site people are using, and then you want to have pe a lot of people enter content on the actual QA site or on not the production site and then you want to have different rules on when the content gets published what status does it need to have does it need to go through like 10,000 modifications and then when it hits a certain status then it gets published on the actual site so that's yeah, let me, one of the use cases when I would actually use it and I, and I would say that you know those there's Microsoft kind of saying hey here's the feature here's how it works and then there's reality I actually haven't hardly seen anybody use this particular feature because replication and SharePoint really don't don't exist. And so when it comes down to it, when it's like, oh, that sounds fantastic, I'm gonna make a site and then have it go out to the extranet and keep those in sync, that's not how it works. That's not how reality works either. Um, if somebody really was truly looking for replication, I would say they should be looking at a third-party product. If you're trying, trying to say one time, then you're talking about migration, um, and there's better migration tools than cross-site publishing too. <laughs> so you got to be careful, I would say. If it's just a list, then maybe you can get away with it, but in reality, I, I don't see it. It's kind of funny, but, but I don't see it. Um, how do I remove deleted AD users from site collections but not disabled users? I was able to do that on Control Point, but now haven't been able to do it on SharePoint Online. Um, a lot of fun PowerShell, I would say. Yeah. So yeah what you'll gonna... have to do is like you're gonna have. Oh, sorry, Joel. I'll let you go. No, no, no. You go. Okay. So 
uh, without getting too technical, basically, you're going to have to use the SharePoint Online module and the Azure AD one. You're going to have to go look to every site collection, do a get SPO user for every user that's there. Just do a check to see if they still exist in the AD. If they don't exist from the AD, delete them from SharePoint. That's about it. But PowerShell is your answer over here. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I was wondering if Chris had an answer to how they might be able to do that with the tool. Yeah, well, at the item level, you can use the tool to parse, um, you know, files. That's what they're trying to do. Trying to find uh, users that, um, it's like deleted users, but not disabled users. I think it's some kind oh, of, um, trying to clean up the site collection from, these people no longer exist in the company, but they're still showing up. Um, and so some, some people, they want them just to stop showing. Uh, I think in SharePoint land, we like to keep them around. So it's like that person really did create that document, but they're going to stay in the user info table. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, the user information list, yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, yeah. some of those permissions just stick around even though they're no longer in the company. And so they want to, like, remove them, remove them without, you know, they're, they're just disabling them in AD because that person maybe got hired again. But you don't want to leave the permissions, especially if it's an external-facing environment or there some people may be worried about it even though it doesn't do anything yeah well the tool has two reports that can do it there's so there's one aspect where it's the permissions report so you can build a permission to report across the sites and then gather the site level list level item level permissions and then you can filter um, you'd need to know who the users are uh, for that report that you're looking for that might be not there anymore and then you can filter that report by those users and it'll show you where they are located. Another one is called the orphaned user report um, as part of the SharePoint Essentials toolkit that will allow you to uh, find ones that are disabled or deleted from Active Directory but present in SharePoint. And then there's the item level report where if, if it's like in the user information list or you've got references to that user, the item level report can can search for a user by display name or username. You just enter the text that you're trying to search, and it'll it'll match metadata as well as the people picker fields. If you if you need to find them like that, so. Cool. Um, and kind of one of the things I'm seeing in in a few different questions. I'll try and kind of consolidate it. Is um, people who've they want to find the content that's no longer being used. So sites, site collections that just really aren't being used anymore that they, they can then archive. Any, any recommendations there? Yeah, I mean, that's going to be PowerShell. That's the easy mm -hmm. one if you're going to use out of the box. Or you could actually use the Essentials Toolkit as well that Chris is talking about because that actually does the same thing. You have the ability to trawl through the content the same as you would if you were going to use PowerShell, I suppose. And then you basically check in for dates of when things were done. And then you're initiating a delete or archive or whatever else. Um, so the, there's two different ways of doing it. The, the toolkit does it really, really well. I actually quite like that, the way it does it, because it means I can keep running it again and again and again, which I'm always a great advocate of being able to schedule something. There's no point going through the effort of, like Vlad said, writing some majorly complex PowerShell and then never running it again. That makes no sense. So trying to have something you can run again, but definitely the toolkit does that, um, and that works really, really well. Find sites, content, libraries, lists that have been sitting around for ages, and then giving the ability to clean them up too. Yeah. Any uh, recommendations? Oh, go go ahead. Thanks, Liam. Uh, something yeah. just to add on what Liam said is that uh, you can do it for PowerShell, but it doesn't really work well. One of the problems with PowerShell, it looks at a lot of the hidden stuff which you don't really have access or care. So when you actually do a get SPO site last content modified date, if Microsoft did an update on SharePoint Online, which happens almost every day or every, let's say week, I'll be generous. Uh, the thing is, it will update your actual last content modified date from PowerShell. So the information you get a lot of the times from PowerShell is actually not true unless you do really complicated scripts. But if you try to use the site last content modified date, that is absolutely, that never works anymore. Like whenever I do it now, it always shows like the same day, even if for sites I didn't access in a year. So the tool, uh, the 
SharePoint Accession Tools is a, definitely a lot better than using PowerShell. Great. Yeah, I think PowerShell is so powerful. You're, you, you make a change and there's no rollback, you know. <laughs> you got to be really careful with making changes. Um, so last, last one, um, and uh, we'll have to save some of these questions for later because we, we'll then hand it back to Chris. Um, so Andrew in his, in his questions was saying kind of go SharePoint framework if you can. Um, this person's a little bit worried. They say, um, how can we be sure that SharePoint framework's not creating security holes in our sites? So uh, it's a good question. Um, and I know Liam and I both kind of chimed in on it, but I, I would say that just to rehash what we said or just kind of go a bit further, there's, there, first of all, there's nothing that SharePoint framework's gonna be opening up holes for you. Um, this really is, this problem or this issue or however you wanna look at it, is no different with the SharePoint framework than it is with anything that's custom development. Uh, when you're building something with custom code, you can easily make calls out to external sources or to have that consume stuff from external sources. And the big thing is always gonna to be to, do, to have code reviews of what you roll out into production. There's just no other way around it. There are, there are technical solutions for this. You can put up certain rules and firewalls to block access, outbound access or inbound access to things. Um, but I mean, even as I've spent time working on a defense department uh, server deck at a, you know, the top level security uh, requirements that we have uh, here in the United States, and I can tell you that it's just, it's technically, it's, it's almost impossible if you're going to have any kind of an external access to your application or for your users to get out, unless you put up a complete block. It's, there's no way to technically just put, to, to keep this from happening. To me, it's going to be making sure, look, looking at where you're referencing stuff, making sure that with the SharePoint framework, we have things like CSS and JavaScript that can be hosted in CDNs. So who has access to deploy to those CDNs? Who has access to change that JavaScript? Um, there is absolutely nothing stopping me from rolling out a web part that I put in a SharePoint, I deploy to a SharePoint site that references a JavaScript file that's living in an Azure CDN. It's all deployed, and without my customer ever knowing it, I could go in, change the JavaScript, and now when the CEO goes to the site, I can then I am I can then uh, run my code under his access because he's the one that's logged in, so he's the one that's actually running running the JavaScript. And I could go use the Microsoft Graph or I could use the SharePoint REST API to go get data from anywhere inside of um, SharePoint. Now, the way I would stop that from happening is a code review or making sure who has access to change that JavaScript file. That is that is more of a process thing that you have to implement. Uh, the technology has nothing, it really has nothing to do with it. That's good. So let me, let me hand this back to, uh, to Chris. All right, thanks. Thanks, Joel. Okay, so thanks again, everyone. I apologize. It, it went over a bit. We just have so much. Uh, we've got good information here. And uh, um, we've got uh, one more poll for, for those who are on here now. Uh, um, how should we follow up with you? So uh, for the SharePoint Essentials Toolkit or, um, you know, any questions you have um, for any of the experts, um, I want to ask uh, how what's the best way um, what what time we, we should uh, what's the time frame that we could follow up with you and perhaps schedule um, a screen sharing session and so forth yeah I think some people would probably like to see the demo so anybody who really wants to see the demo can can choose this as well of like when they'd like to yeah. see a demo doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be committed Right, and and you'll have an automatic. Uh, there'll be an email that come that you'll get automated in about an hour. That that'll have the links to the webinar if you're interested. Okay, it's uh, completely optional, obviously. Um, okay, great. You could probably let that run for a little while. Um, we can do some questions while that's up, even. Yeah, sure. Um, um, okay, so someone says. Scanning more than 20,000 files for broken links and replacing them, would that affect the SharePoint server performance? We're using the toolkit. Um, no, well, the, the toolkit is using web services. It's using CSOM. So when it's reading files and opening files, it, it, it caches it into memory on the, you know, on the local machine um, under, you know, under the account that you're using. 
and it's it's similar to I guess opening a web page, but hundreds of times a second. So it depends. You know, if your if your if your SharePoint environment is already a little shaky and at its max, then you know, opening using the toolkit to scan for broken links for twenty thousand files, you know, it typically won't have any uh, significant performance degradation. But you know, do your testing, and um, it's you can you can compare it similar to uh, opening files um, on your web browser, but just many times because it's gonna you know open that those files, open the web pages, et cetera, to read them for parse them for links. Yeah, and I would say that a lot of this comes down to when you talk about performance. Doesn't matter whether it's PowerShell or or the tool using CSOM, it comes down to how many threads. And so if you're writing your own code you can manage performance impact based on the number of threads. And uh, so that's, that's basically how you could manage your performance. If you're doing one thread or 10 threads, you're, you're, you're not gonna notice it on the server because it'd be equivalent to 10 users doing, you know, opening up files and so on. So, you know, recursively, but uh, you get the idea. And um, I just wanna thank everybody on the panel who, who joined us today. Um, thanks for hosting yeah. this, Chris. Oh, no problem. Yeah, thanks, you guys, for joining. I mean, uh, it was great to have such an all-star cast here to, to give all the different angles. I thought it would be, you know, we, I mean, Joel, you, we both thought it was, you know, it's a good uh, way to spend people's valuable time is, you know, I think to get a good overall view of of uh, certain topics. So thank yeah, you, everyone. Thanks, thanks, yeah. thanks to the audience. for We got more than 50% who, who stuck with us this extra half hour, so I, I think we appreciate that, too. <laughs> And if, if you wanted to end with that video, I think you probably could. Yeah, so we do have a, a, a video that we have um, to share of the SharePoint Essentials Toolkit. It just shows a few things. Liam, Liam was uh, kind enough to record it and demonstrate some of the uh, features of the tool. So let me um, s start that. Uh, it's not really letting me start this right now. Oh, I think I have to stop the poll just a minute. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Sorry about the wait. It should come up shortly. And this is just going over some of the features. Okay, thank you everyone for um, for staying on. I know there's still quite a few people still on, so thanks for watching. The uh, I hope you found it useful. The uh, demonstration that Liam did of the SharePoint Essentials Toolkit for our future episodes, um, planning to schedule them every uh, two or three months, um, possibly sooner. But uh, they will be. You will get an email alert if you want to, uh, you know, join future episodes. The website is on the screen there if you, um, where we will also post some free PowerShell scripts for helping you with cleanups. So um, it'll, it'll build an inventory of your sites um, into a, an Excel file format, CSV file, of uh, all site collections um, at once. So it'll be just run once for the entire, and it's uh, two scripts, one for SharePoint Online and one for on-premise that we'll be uh, providing. There will also be a free infographic that we'll be posting so that you can use that um, if you need to regarding uh, SharePoint cleanups and some statistics about, about that. Okay, we'll also, of course, be providing the uh, webinar recording at, uh, on that site. All the questions that we weren't able to get to, uh, we'll be trying to address them in a future episode. Um, and posting the uh, these answers into the, into the site uh, there as well. Okay, uh, so thanks again, everyone, for joining. Uh, it's been really uh, great to have everyone. Um, and again, please visit our website, look, check out our tool, uh, and subscribe uh, from the uh, site that was just on to follow the um, the expert series. And if you follow the expert series, you'll be able to uh, get notified of of all the uh, future episodes. 
Okay, great. So this concludes the first episode of, of the expert series. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to have everyone uh, on with us. Thanks.